everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books podcast. My name is Ross McKeechee. Today we are in conversation. Really delighted to have her, Martha Beck. And before we get into her formal introduction, I just want to let everybody know that although we have people joining in the Banyan Books community from all around the world, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound in Vancouver, BC is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Now, Banyan Books and Sound is in its 50th anniversary year, 50 years in business as Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. A really amazing accomplishment. Uh, still the same owner, Colin Limworth, running the shop. And so I just want to let everybody know, please support local independent bookstores. Every time you make a purchase from Banyan, you support all kinds of great free programming like our event today. You can purchase books or other products at our website, banyan.com, B-A-N-Y-E-N.com, or you can call us. There's a 1-800 number listed on the website. We ship all over the world, or you can go into the shop seven days a week. We're open. Our guest today. Martha Beck, PhD, is a best-selling author, life coach, and speaker who specializes in helping individuals and groups achieve greater levels of personal and professional success. She holds three Harvard degrees in social science, has taught career development at the American Graduate School of International Management, and was research assistant to Dr. John Cotter at Harvard Business School. As president of her company, Martha Beck Incorporated, she speaks around the world and offers teleclasses and in-person workshops. Through her program, Wayfinder Life Coach Training, Martha trains life coaches from all over the world. She's a regular columnist for, the o, for o, the Oprah Magazine, since its inception. And she has been described by US, USA Today as the best known life coach in America. That's something else. (laughs) Our honored guest is the author of nine nonfiction books and one novel. Several of these books are New York Times and international bestsellers, including Finding Your Own North Star and Expecting Adam. Today, she is here speaking about her latest book, which is an instant New York Times bestseller titled The Way of Integrity, Finding the Path, to your true self, a fantastic book, beautiful and challenging. Elizabeth Gilbert says of this book, this radiant book will not only change your life, but perhaps even save it. So Banyan Books community, please join me in a warm, heartfelt welcome for Martha Beck, PhD. Martha, thank you. I think I was asleep when that was happening. (laughs) Thank you, Ross. You're very kind. Oh, we're so delighted to have you here. We really are. Well, couldn't be more pleased to be here. I freaking love your bookstore. Sorry for the informal language, but I've been going (laughs) to your website just going, I want that, I want that, I want that. So I'll be supporting you in more ways than one. Awesome. Awesome. Now, this book uh, is, is a, like I said, it's beautiful, it's challenging. Um, I, I really enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. Um, it's based on, you know, you give this four-step process for the way of integrity based on the book, The Divine Comedy by Dante. Can you just give us an understanding of why, why, the, why this book? Well, I read The Divine Comedy when I was about 18. I'm sure it was a college assignment at first, but I read everything at the time as a self-help book because my entire life was one long cry for help. So, you know, I was too young and dumb to know that it was fancy literature. I just read it as a metaphor for my inner life. When Dante goes through the inferno and he keeps going and he keeps going and he gets to the very pit of hell, and his guide tells him, no, you have to keep going. And he does. Once he passes the center of the earth, he's going up instead of down without changing direction. And that to me was like, aha, that's how I deal with my anxiety and depression. Just the only way out is through. So, and it worked, thank God. So I have always, and then I read the, the, um, the other parts of the divine comedy as a further metaphor for how you progress 
to a really, really happy life. It ends in paradise, right? And I just became aware that Dante was this brilliant psychologist who was creating a metaphorical map of the, the way from misery to happiness. And I'd kept this to myself for like 30 years. And finally I decided I might as well write it down. <laughs> so that's, that's um, how this book came to be shaped the way it is. Yeah, and it's it's really it's really has a beautiful shape, uh, and it it you, you share a lot about your personal story, your life story in here. Yeah, was that and was that a challenge for you to share as openly as you did, or is that something you're used to always doing? Well, the whole idea of integrity, if, first of all, it's not a moralizing thing. I'm not like shaking a finger and going bad bad dog. I'm it, integrity means intact. It comes from the same word as integer, which just means a whole number. So when I say integrity, I'm talking about being whole and intact. And what I have seen in my life as a social scientist and as a coach and everything is that we all start out intact, but before we can even speak, there's so much social compliance in us and so much pressure upon us that we end up abandoning aspects of our true nature and joining the culture in ways that may not be sort of true to us. And we split ourselves apart. So to come back into integrity, to come back into wholeness, that is the whole idea of, I believe, how to be happy. So the whole concept had to be, I had to live it to give it, as we say, I know that sounds so cheesy, but I thought if I can't, if I don't live this story, I can't tell someone who's in a really difficult situation, you can get through this. And, and I'd been in a few dicey situations, right? So for example, I left the Mormon church, but my father was a big cheese in the church and there was sexual abuse involved and everything. And I, I wrote a book about that because I felt like it was epidemic in Mormon culture. And I got death threats and people threatened my children and um, it was not easy to be honest about that and to be open about that. But now that I've written this book about integrity and someone comes to me and says, yes, but I live in a repressive society and it's dangerous, I can say, right with you. So that's why I included so much of my own story so that I would be able to show that I was walking my talk. A very courageous story, your life story indeed. And we'll get into some more about that later, I'm sure. Thank you. One of the key points you you make here is about the inner teacher on this path of integrity. Now, the first the first stage, there's four stages you give, and the yeah. first one from Dante's uh, Divine Comedy is the Dark Wood of Error. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, and also about the importance of the inner teacher in our lives. Absolutely. So the the Dark Wood of Error is just the first part of Dante's Inferno, but I think it's where most people that I've worked with have spent most of their lives. So the, the Divine Comedy begins by saying, in the middle of my life, I came to in a dark and foggy wood, and I had no idea how I'd gotten off course. I'd forgotten how I would arrived at this place, and I hated it, and I wanted to get out. This is a obviously paraphrasing. <laughs> and I think a lot of people in our culture, because they've, they have experienced that split, what happens is that culture and the way things are done pulls you away from your true path, whatever that is for you, and into a life that looks good from the outside, but feels wrong. But you don't know why it's wrong. And that's why being in a foggy wood is such a good metaphor for it. You're like, everything should be okay. I'm doing the things I've been told to do. It's just, it's not working. I'm not happy. I don't like it here. And then you start looking for ways out. And in Dante's case, nobody even talks about this because it's just a few verses. Out of the dark wood rises this mountain that he calls Mount Delectable and it's bathed in sunlight. So it's golden and it looks wonderful. And people are climbing as hard as they can to get to the top. And he thinks, well, that way is happiness. But it's not, it's continuous with the dark wood of error. And I see it as the achievement of like power, wealth and status. And Dante tries to go up there, but he keeps getting chased down and he's exhausted. And at the point when he's ready to give up, a teacher appears. Now, if you follow the, the like Joseph Campbell's model of the hero's journey, right after the hero starts on the adventure, 
a teacher appears. It's part of the sort of the, the mythic saga of every culture. Yes. And so in his case, it's the ghost of the poet Virgil. But really, Dante was talking about having read Virgil's work in books. So when he finds this magical guide, what he's really doing is he's looking to poetry and, and wisdom that he's internalized from Virgil, and he makes that into a character. Well, when we're really stuck, this is what I've found as, as somebody who's looked had a front row seat into a lot of people's lives. When you're really stuck and you're willing to say, I don't know how I got here, I don't like it, and the way they tell me to get up on the mountain isn't working for me, I need help, help arrives. And it may be in a book, it may be, it may be in Banyan bookstore for sure. <laughs> um, it may be a friend or a yoga class or a, you know, a, whatever, a rock concert, but something happens to say, pay attention, you're about to start on a different path. You're about to find your way to yourself. And um, it's really delightful watching hundreds of people find teachers and then internalize those so that they now have a wisdom that goes with them wherever. And uh, it, I don't think it ever fails, actually. Beautiful. Can you tell, can you tell us what, um, what Dante means? There's a, a short quote here when he says about Virgil, he led me in among the secret things. Yeah, I mean, there are different uh, translations. I read so many translations of the Divine Comedy while I was writing this, but um, he comes to the famous gate. So he's out in the dark wood and Virgil takes him to this really scary looking gate. And above it, it says, there's a big sign and it says, through me to the city of woe, it's not it's not auspicious. And, and the final words are, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. And Dante's like, seriously? Like, <laughs> this is where you're taking me? And Virgil's like, you're going to love it. And um, it's, it's a terrifying thing that everyone goes through when they decide to find their way back to their integrity. You end up going into the places where you are keeping secrets from yourself. So the vast majority of people are not out of integrity because they're lying deliberately. We don't lose our integrity because we're being, trying to be bad. We lose our integrity because we're trying to be good. And along the way, we start keeping secrets from ourselves, which is another way of saying we go into denial. So for example, say your family was not healthy or functional, or say your father was an alcoholic, but he drank in secret and no one knew. So you might feel this vague discontent, a sense of something being wrong and not being able to trust people, you know, a variety of effects that people might have if they're the child of an alcoholic, but nobody in the family ever talks about it. It's a big secret. So the gate to hell out of the fog comes when we're willing to say the secret things. This, my father was an alcoholic. You know, this is not okay. I'm not going to keep it secret. Or for that matter, I am an alcoholic, if that's the truth for you. It's amazing how far we can go keeping secrets from ourselves. And there, there's a ton of research, really good medical research, showing that telling lies and keeping secrets is absolutely horrific for our health, for our bodies, for our psyches, for, every, for our relationships. If they ask people, they, they did a study where they just said to a bunch of people, maybe try lying less for a couple of weeks. <laughs> so these, these people from the study, they went home and nobody policed them. They just tried not to lie for a few weeks, came back and compared to a control group, they'd had fewer doctor visits, they'd had fewer illnesses, their relationships were going better. And this was true, even if they told say three fewer lies per week, and lying is just one way that you can lose your integrity. You can also do things that aren't right for you. But the, the point is there's this, we constantly keep secret from ourselves the fact that we're not facing our own reality. And when we're doing that, we remain in the dark wood of error. And the only way out is to say, what am I keeping secret? I'm gonna not keep it secret anymore. 
So this this path of of telling the truth is is really the the key point here and on the path of integrity is being in our own truth. It's a yeah, absolutely all the way through. But the only part where so there's three parts, right? So there's the dark wood of error. That's not great. We're all living there. Then there's the inferno, which is the most famous part of Dante's Divine Comedy. There are like a zillion translations of the inferno and far fewer of the remaining two thirds of the book because no, every, the inferno is very familiar to us <laughs> because we spend our lives fighting and lying and uh, there are these different levels of you know all the seven deadly sins and everything and that's where most of us spend our lives like vying for for money and for position and for power I mean watch Game of Thrones it's just a bunch of people right out of Dante's Inferno so to go through that you have to be willing to tell some really scary truths now once you get through that there's no more bad stuff. And people don't realize this, that the second Dante goes down and down and down through deeper and deeper layers of deception. And first he, the first two thirds are just people who are accidentally telling lies they don't even know, like they just did something by mistake. And then you get down to the bottom and it's people who are deliberately violent, who deliberately betray others. And at the very core of hell there's the monster lucifer locked in a lake of ice and for reasons i explain in the book what this is is the deepest lie we all tell ourselves it's the first original lie that babies learn because when the adults around us say the way you naturally are isn't the way we want you to behave we sell out our innocence we sell out the baby to go along with the culture. And that leaves us with a, a pervasive sense of simply not being good enough, not being okay. And we can chase the sense of being okay for the rest of our lives. But once you go down and you're willing to face the deepest level of that shame, and I wanna go backwards and do a little meditation so that people who are listening don't feel like this is gonna be horrifying, because <laughs> it's not, it doesn't have to be. But once you are willing to go through the most frightening and shameful things in your own heart, like in therapy or with a friend or whatever, the rest of it is like, boom. It takes him like three lines to say, and then we, we went through this pit in the center of hell and suddenly instead of being in an even worse place, we were on a dry path that led up toward heaven and we, we went out and once again beheld the stars. And from there on, it's all happy. It's all climbing toward paradise. And there are some really good lessons to learn along the way. But the inferno is where most of most people stop. Right. People stop there. Yeah. And and in the inferno, you know, there's there's a whole lot that goes on in there. One of the things you define hell in a particular way. And you also make a, a clear distinction between pain and suffering. Right. What's your definition of hell and how do you distinguish between pain and suffering? So for me, uh, the definition of hell is the feeling of a mind that is believing something it knows at a different level to be untrue. And I know that sounds really weird, but literally, if you believe the thought, I'm no good, and that's not true to a deeper part of yourself, which it never is, you will live in hell. You will suffer, you will ruin relationships, you will self-sabotage at work, you will destroy your own life simply because you believe very firmly that you're no good, while another part of you knows that that's nothing but a stinking lie, right? So hell is the feeling that we get when we believe something that is not true. And I, I I mean, that sounds so simplistic, but when I, you know, I've, I've tested this for 30 years. And if you give somebody, if you say something true to someone and it lets them into their truth, it doesn't matter how bad it sounds. Like I remember saying to one man, he was describing his childhood to me. And I said, your mother was sexually abusing you. You realize this. And he looked at me and he goes, are you just saying that to make me feel good? I was like, 
that's not ordinarily what you say to people <laughs> to make them feel good. But it felt good to him because she told him, oh, no, this is fine. But it wasn't. And he knew it. And so to be given the truth was this huge relief. And by the same token, if something's not true, if you are heart sick, heartbroken, and someone says, now smile and act cheerful, um, because, you know, turn that frown upside down, everything's coming up roses, and you try to go along with it, it is soul murder, no matter how good it may sound on the surface. So the truth sets us free, sets us free, sets us free, and every wisdom tradition tells us that. And Dante really goes into detail about what we have to say about the truth of everything. So one of the things that comes up then is, well, what about if your suffering is hell being in physical pain or is there a pain that isn't about truth? Um, I once went to a pain clinic where there was a sign over the door that said, uh, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. And what that meant was we're going to experience physical pain. We're going to experience loss, heartbreak. These are natural parts of human life. But suffering comes, as Buddhists would say, from attachment to the things that make us hurt. So attachment to thinking we shouldn't be in pain, thinking we shouldn't have lost a loved one or be facing death ourselves. Interestingly, we were just talking before this, um, I just had a foot surgery that it, they fused two bones, they cut two bones and grafted them in and pinned them in place and it was pretty involved. And then it got infected and I didn't know it. So for the last two months, uh, up until I got the medication like three days ago, I was in really excruciating pain. And I can tell you, it's been one of the most joyful times of my life. I had two months where I was too sick to do anything, but experience the bliss of being, um, you know, stay in meditation, read, Zoom my loved ones, work on, you know, and there was so much pain mm. and it didn't dent my happiness at all. Now, other people have felt much worse pain and I'm not saying that that's not true, but I am saying no matter what hurts us, that long-term awful suffering that makes us want to kill ourselves, that is optional. And it only comes from believing things that are not true. One, one of the things uh, when, we, when we make a commitment, and you made a commitment in your life to one year of no lies telling the yeah. truth. <laughs> How, how scary was that? Because I think when we, if we make that commitment to ourselves, as you say in the book, there's going to be a lot of obstacles that come up within us and from our culture, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you tell? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm laughing because this is not the way I recommend doing it in the book. I give you very gentle steps. Okay. But I decided this is a spiritual bookstore, so I can talk about this. I had one of the things I had to choose in my life was whether or not to end a, a late term pregnancy when I found out my son had Down syndrome. And although I am pro choice, integrity for me at that point was to refuse the abortion. We knew he was healthy, basically, they could see with ultrasound. So um, I, I carried him to birth and, and he's, he still lives with me. He's awesome. But during that pregnancy I was so scared I was so bereft I was in so much pain that I became very open and I actually had a my first really strong spiritual experiences of my life um, feelings of being comforted by this ineffable power and it was only for a few minutes and I became obsessed with getting it back it was the happiest I'd ever been in my life. And it only lasted a few minutes. And I thought, I have to wait for the rest of my life to feel that again. I became obsessed with reading near-death experiences because I just wanted to fast forward to the part where I got to go home. And when I was 29, I just thought, okay, I can't take this anymore. And they say the truth sets you free. So I'm just going to take it literally. So on New Year's Eve, 
I made a New Year's resolution that I would not lie for 365 days, not at all. And I kept the resolution. <laughs> and during that year, I left uh, my religion, my family of origin, that went with the religion, all the friends I'd made, because I grew up in a very Mormon area before leaving when I was 17. Uh, my home, my, uh, oh yeah, I quit my job uh, and my industry. I was a tenure track professor, found out I didn't like academia, academia, realized I was gay. So there went my marriage, like everything, everything went into the bonfire of truth. And it was, it was not, it was not for cowards. I have to say that as in South Africa, they say it's not for ants. It's not for little things. But in the middle of all that, for the first time in my life, I came out of depression. My anxiety dropped. I had had three progressive autoimmune diseases. All of them went into remission. The truth actually did set me free. But I wouldn't, that's like taking you and throwing you off a cliff and saying, you'll feel better when you land, if you live. <laughs> so in this book and over the years I got more and more gentle with people because I realized slow is fast with this and gentle is powerful so I want to do we were talking before about processes that I've spelled out in the book to help at different points yes. in the quest for integrity and one of without question um, the scariest thing is when you realize that your truth when you tell it and when you live it is going to rock the boat in your culture, in your society. Like you, maybe you'll leave a relationship. Maybe you'll um, dis disappoint your family. I mean, there are so many ways be looked down on by your peer group, whatever. So that is the scariest thing for a human to the point that the number one phobia for humans is fear of public speaking. And the number two fear is death. Like it is more terrifying for us to be looked at by other people and try to present ourselves than it is to die. So that's why most of us are so socially controlled. And when we know we have to leave the social norm of our couplehood, family, church, ethnicity, nationality, whatever, it is maximum fear. So the refuge for that, which I didn't know when I was doing this, is a kind of meditative practice where you can cope with the present moment. Now, later on, after I, during that year that I told the truth, that was when my childhood sexual abuse all came pouring out, of course. And it was 10 years after that before I dared to write about it publicly because I knew I would get death threats. I knew that people were going to take strong exception to this. So when I got to that point, I was so afraid because I was on this book tour where I had to have bodyguards and I never knew I was getting graphic death threats from anonymous people. And it's, it's very unnerving. So I, I created this meditation and I'd really like to teach it to everybody watching because wherever you are in the process, if you're frightened, this is your, this is fail safe. This is safe haven, it's sanctuary. And I call it the surrender allow meditation. So um, the first thing is to just notice that from the far reaches of the universe, you know, other galaxies all the way through the solar system and right down to where you are right now in your body, in this moment, the one that just ended, you couldn't really control much. You couldn't really change anything in that time, right? And time is just this, 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 this. So it's always now, but it's always a different now. Even the present is now in the past. So to bring your mind out of past and future and bring it right here is to acknowledge that you don't need to control anything in this precise instant. So you surrender your resistance to the universe being the way it is right now. That's it. You don't have to accept anything else. Just surrender resistance 
to this moment, not 10 seconds from now, now, and surrender attachment to the last moment. So I used to think, I remember getting dressed to go uh, to a book talk in Chicago when I'd gotten a particularly vivid death threat. And I was, I'd had nightmares about it. And I was getting dressed and I was thinking, is this the last time I'll ever get dressed? And I got so frightened that I ended up like curled in a ball in this hotel room bathroom. And I thought, all right, what happens if I die? I'd already like tripled my life insurance for my kids. Um, I thought, well, all you do when you die is you breathe out. That's it. That's the last thing I'm ever going to do is breathe out. And I can handle that. And then I thought, okay, but I'm still alive. So I need to breathe in. And I realized that every time, the first thing you did in this life was breathe in. And the last thing you'll do is breathe out. So I started to think every time I breathe in, I'm taking up a new life in this moment. And every time I breathe out, I'm surrendering the life I just had. So it's always new. So I started to think every out breath, surrender resistance to everything in the universe being exactly the way it is right now. And when you breathe in, allow and accept that everything is as it is. That's all you have to acknowledge. So let's do it for a few breaths. So breathe out and think I surrender all resistance to things as they are right now. Breathe in and think I allow everything to be as it is right now. Breathe out. I surrender all resistance to things as they are. Breathe in. I allow everything to be as it is. And then I just shorten it to surrender on the exhale and allow on the inhale. Surrender. Allow. Surrender. Allow. And just follow that with your mind. Surrender everything. It's all gone. Allow. It all comes back in. It's gone. It's new. Just back and forth and back and forth. And what that does is it brings you into presence or it brings me into presence and into non-resistance. And in that moment is actually the only real truth you can ever experience because the past doesn't exist anymore. The future doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is now. So when you drop your resistance to the moment and you allow the moment to be as it is, not only does fear go away, but everything comes into this integrity to the truth of what is in this moment. And for that moment, you are kept, you are held in complete alignment with reality as it is. You're not fighting it. And you can rest there anytime, anytime you're afraid and it will pick you back up. And I just, I got up off the bathroom floor and I just kept doing that the whole, in the car, walking into the bookstore. It, I just kept doing it the whole time and it saved me and it saved me countless times since then. So I wanted to share that as my favorite process from the book. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there are so many great processes in the book. Um, it's really an engaged process. It's not, you're not just reading and taking it in. You're, you're asking the reader to, you're saying, Hey, do this, do this. And it, it's very yeah. challenging and w wonderful. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting because I think what happened to Dante, I may get, be getting ahead of myself. I think he had an experience that in Asia would have been called awakening or enlightenment. And experiences like this have happened to individuals all around the world from the beginning of time. Most of them we never heard about. Others we heard about, um, you know, the Buddha, Jesus, um, Teresa of Avila. I think Walt Whitman and Shakespeare both experienced something like this. I think they're, it's not that uncommon. And now, I, for Dante, it was paradise, but he describes it with the same types of image that Asian masters use to describe enlightenment. And now we have brain science that's looking at 
like Tibetan meditators. And it, they discovered that the, the feeling of enlightenment comes when two parts of the brain go silent. One is the sense of being a separate self. And one is the sense that gives us a feeling of control. So if, to be enlightened, you have to ultimately give up your sense of being a separate self and your sense of control. And that's where integrity will take you. And when you get there, it is, it, it is magical. It is miraculous. And that, that like paradise is real, you guys. It's not only a biological reality. It's one that one brain scientist says, we are biologically predisposed to seek. So it takes us all the way to the miraculous, the divine. And I think that's worth a little hard work, don't you? I agree. <laughs> okay, well, you just touched on the fourth stage in the process. So maybe we can just, we can step back a little bit and talk about the third stage, yeah. purgatory. Now, this is this might be a loaded term for some people. Can you right. tell what, what is meant by purgatory in this well, context? It's come to mean like another place where you suffer. Actually, you know, before Dante, purgatory wasn't a big part of medieval Catholicism. You just either went to heaven or hell and you didn't really go to heaven <laughs> because you were born with original sin. And that <laughs> so Dante was part of the popularization of this idea that there's a place where you get to make things right. So nobody realizes how liberal Dante actually was. All you had to do to get out of the, infer the inferno is to say, oh, I was mistaken. I would like to do better. And then you had to go to purgatory, boom. And every now and then, like the angels would come down and say, anybody want out? And the inferno, the demons would go, no, we like it here. Um, and I think every demon represented a part of, of the self that's attached to a lie. And um, the ones that left, including Dante himself, ended up at the base of a huge mountain. And it was actually supposedly the, the, the earth that was blasted out, like it made the inferno was this big pit because like Lucifer fell from heaven, hit the earth, made a big crater. And then all the dirt piled up and became a mountain. And the mountain is purgatory and you have to climb it to get to paradise. And it just purgatory simply means cleansing. So what everybody on purgatory is singing and joyful and thrilled because they know they're going to go to paradise. They just have to learn to live their truth. So they've gotten rid of whatever they were attached to in the inferno. And now they have to climb up by exercising the virtues that they now learn to embrace. So if you were really super violent and you ended up in the inferno, to climb past a certain point in purgatory, you would have to learn to, to um, the, the principle of universal compassion. And he, Dante symbolizes that as mountain climbing. You know, it's a hard thing, it's not easy. So in my book, that's where you've been to your therapist or your life coach or whatever, and they've told you, okay, th these are the things that you hate about your life. Like you hate your job, you hate your marriage, you hate, it's not good for you. So then it's like, all right, now I know the truth, but to live the truth, I have to leave the things that aren't good for me. And I have to embrace the things that I know are good for me. So I got to quit smoking. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not easy. And that's why, especially at first, purgatory is very steep. And Dante says, you have to have incredible yearning to get up that mountain. So one of the things I ask people to do is like list a few things you want. People say, okay, I want a house, bigger house. I want a nicer car or whatever. And then I say, all right, now in the dark of night, when you wake up and you've just had a nightmare, what do you yearn for? Like, what is the longing you feel? And it's never the car. It's always a feeling state and it's not there's not much variety and I've tried this all over the world different third world countries all from from beggars on the street to billionaires and people yearn for peace love freedom belonging you know and a few other feeling states 
And the yearning for that has to be so strong that you are willing to leave the way you've been living if it will get you peace, joy, love, belonging, whatever else you yearn for. And the weird thing is that when you, when you reach those states, what I found is that all the other things like the house and the car come to meet you there. So it, it, in a very miraculous way. So I have this theory, and I think I say it in the book that the, the truest thing I've heard anybody say, so I test different statements on people to say if they see if they feel true. So anybody who's listening, try this sentence. I am meant to live in peace. So if you say, I am meant to live in peace, what you get from that is what I call the ring of truth or the chime of truth. It's like a puzzle piece fitting into place. It's integrity. I am meant to live in peace. So then when people finally do leave what's bad for them and embrace what's good for them, they end up feeling peaceful. The weird thing is that everything they've ever wanted starts popping almost magically into their reality. Like really, truly the stuff I asked for as a little kid, like believing in a Mormon God, that stuff came to find me when I reached a state of peace. So I think the moment we pray for anything, we're given it and it is sent to us immediately. But the catch is it's sent to our real home address, which is peace. And if we're not in peace, the universe will not send our stuff to desperation and misery. That would just keep us there. So we have to go home. We have to go into peace the way Dante did climbing the mountain of purgatory. And then once you get to, to a high level of peace, bang, 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 stuff that you've been asking for your whole life literally manifest like the whole new age thing it starts to happen and uh freaked me out man but it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> i just want to take a moment to remind our our live community here that martha will be taking some of your questions shortly so please go down to the q a tab on your screen and type feel free to type in your questions uh we'll get to as many of those as we can in a few minutes one of the really uh interesting things I found was when you described Cartman's uh, triangle, the drama yeah. triangle, and yeah. also David Emerald's uh, empowerment uh, triangle or dynamic. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Oh my gosh, such a powerful thing. And Dante describes it in the Inferno and Purgatory. And then it took till the 1970s or 60s before a psychologist named Stephen Cartman noticed this. And it's a, it's a way of relating to others where there are only three roles in a drama. And one is the victim and the person victimizing them is a persecutor. And then there's a rescuer. So very often I said something about alcoholism before. For example, you'll get somebody who's an alcoholic who gets drunk and, and says, you know, my life was so bad and people are bad to me. And then you get a codependent person who comes in to rescue them. Oh, you're right. Oh my God, let me get you another drink. You have nobody's ever been as victimized as you. And as for your parents, I'm going to go give them a piece of my mind and like sets out to rescue them from the persecutor. Um, at which point, the rescuer then becomes the persecutor of the parents. So the rescuer goes and yells at the parents. They are now like, why are you attacking us? Why are you persecuting us? We're victims. Weirdly, Sometimes even the child will start to defend the, the new victim because the rescuer role is the one that's left. So people will switch through their whole relationships. They will either stay in one position as usually as the victim or the rescuer. Yeah, life, <laughs> help um, healing people in general tend to get stuck in the rescuer role, I'll just say. But as you know, if you've ever tried to aggressively to help a, a victim, you will eventually be seen as a persecutor because you're trying to help them change. So this goes round and round and round. And I teach all my coaches to, to be aware of it. And then David Emerald came along, I believe in the 80s, and he did this brilliant thing where he flipped the whole triangle into sort of a bright side. And in the bright side, the persecutor is a challenger. So if somebody's really attacking you, you don't see them as 
inflicting it on you, you say, okay, like me with my foot, I was like, why does this hurt so much? How's it trying to challenge me? I didn't feel victimized because I know it's like happening for me and not to me, or I believe that. Then instead of the rescuer, David Emerald says, you need a coach. So not someone who says, poor you, let me fix that. But someone who says, wow, that's tough. What are you going to do about it? Like, I believe in you, which is a whole different thing. And then the stroke of absolute genius is that the victim becomes creator. So if you're in a victimized situation, like Nelson Mandela stuck for 27 years in a tiny cell on a horrible windswept island, he became the creator of such a huge social, like tidal wave of energy and belief that he shifted the, the whole experience of a nation and the world from inside a cell where he wasn't even allowed to have photographs of him go out to the world. He created something, an energy, a way of being. He came into total integrity. And when you go into total integrity, a wave of energy starts going out into the world. So that's one place I, I ended the book is the world's in a tough place right now. And if you go into total integrity, then instead of being a victim of climate change and pandemic and everything, all the other horrors, if you can turn it into an opportunity to be creator, what will I do with this? And you're in total integrity, that becomes your mission in life. That's how you find your mission in life. Wherever you're challenged, you become the creator. Beautiful, the power of the creative response. What, what I mean, there, there's so much we could cover here. Obviously because of our time, we, we're just getting snippets and I really recommend everybody to check this book out. It's very helpful. What could the world look like if everybody started trying to put this into practice? <laughs> I've asked people that I consider to be enlightened or close to it. And I've gotten the most surprising responses. Um, one really enlightened person said people would start suing the president. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I did not expect that. But the main change that I think would happen immediately is that people would become much less afraid. There would be a, like there are waves of fear coming off the internet, off the television, um, in conversation. And the first thing that happens, like just coming into that surrender allow meditation, you go into a place of calm where your brain is literally resonating with slower, smoother brain waves that entrain or pull into synchrony other brains. So if a very, very calm person goes into a room full of strangers that, and they don't talk, the strangers' brains will entrain to the state of peace in the calmest person in that room. So if we started finding our own peace, which is our own integrity, which is the magical manifesting place, everything would get a lot less frightening. Mm -hmm. And from there, like reason and creativity and inventiveness would be used instead of, you know, arguing and trying to stab each other and um, screaming about different political positions and all that fear-based stuff would just go. And instead of imagining more horrors to inflict, we'd start imagining um, ways to heal the world and each other. And we, we could, we could do it so easily if we all had that way of being. Yes, thank you. We're going to, if you're okay with it, get to some of our, our live community questions. Yes, please. Okay, the first one is from Kathy who says, Hi, Martha. I'm a therapist at a community mental health center. Wow. And I've recommended your book to several clients. Yeah. I've noticed that sometimes people can misinterpret the concept of not telling lies as permission to be aggressive and over the top with others regarding telling the truth. What is the balance in telling the truth without becoming aggressively painful to others? Mm. There's a, it's a line I put in a different book is uh, nothing really true ever turns out to be unkind and nothing really kind ever turns out to be untrue. Like if you are the tone and the 
the delivery of something can be as important, more important. I mean, the actual content of the words is like 24% of the meaning. The far, by far the bulk of the impact comes from the way you speak and your physical comportment, your tone of voice, and actually the energy. I mean, there's tangible energy that comes off us. Um, it can be measured by magnetometers. So cruelty, Dante would put that in the realm of the violent. And if I said to you, um, you know, like if I tried to out somebody who's gay and I did it in a nasty, brutal way that was meant to hurt them, that's violent. And that's not my integrity because genuine integrity always says I will treat others as I wish to be treated, the golden rule. I also believe in something I call the Eller Nedlog, which is golden rule spelled backwards. So this is what I tell people, always treat other people as you would like to be treated. And also the reverse of that, the Eller Nedlog is never allow yourself to be treated in a way that you would never treat someone else. So don't scream and yell and hurt somebody with a true statement if you wouldn't wanna be screamed at that way. And by the same token, if somebody comes at you like that and says they're just trying to tell the truth, know that they are lying, they are betraying the natural compassion of their integrity by acting in aggressive ways. And the words are the least of it at that point. So don't accept people's violence. Don't believe it, don't listen to it, and don't inflict it. There's no way you can absolutely police this, but, but the feeling of suffering and the feeling of the ring of truth are the two things that I take every client through. Does this feel healing or does this feel violent and damaging? And you can always tell. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Donna who asks, how do you resolve the internal conflict of past behaviors which may have hurt someone like an affair while now you are following the way of integrity? Is it vital to confess that that past choice? And what if back then the choice was the truest path, but the not telling the other person you're committed to was the lie? Wonderful question. And here's the thing we get really, our culture is very fixated on, on science and evidentiary truth. And for that reason, like I did my first year, I didn't lie at all with my words. And I try not to lie with my actions. But by the end of that year of not telling a single lie, I had gone through a lot of moral reasoning. And I was like, okay, say I'm living in Germany at the time of the Nazis and I'm hiding a family of Jews in the basement. And the SS comes and asks me, would I tell them the truth? No, I would lie to their faces and feel like it was the more, more, the more moral choice, the more integrous choice. So as we go through our lives, we have to be feeling, and that's why, oh, you know, Ross asked me about the inner teacher and I didn't really go into this deeply enough. Um, the inner teacher is that click of truth, that ring of truth, that resonance that says, ah, yeah, that one, Yes, I do believe that my father was an alcoholic. And yes, I believe that I need to quit my job, like that I've been doing some things that aren't good for me either. So once you find that, that is the teacher that guides your actions. And it will tell you, for example, I mean, how much do you tell a child as the child is growing about your own past trauma, about violence in the world? There are always these judgment calls to be made but you have an inner sense of truth, an inner teacher that will say to you, the way Virgil say, says to Dante, right in that moment, here's the way you know is right for you right now. So I don't judge anyone who has kept secrets, who has done things undercover because some social systems are so destructive and insane that that is a more moral choice, but you know within yourself whether you're just hiding something because you'd rather not face the music or whether you're actually in integrity. It's up to you. Thank you. There, there's a, a question that fits well with what you just said from Jennifer, who says, do you ever find that complacent settling is mistaken for living in integrity? That's the dark wood of error. Like the, the, the way you tell someone who's in the dark wood of error is how you say, how's your life? And they say, fine. 
it's fine. Fine is code for, I don't know where I am and I hate this, but we don't even know that we're, we don't like where we are because socially we're told that it's fine. So one of the things I used to do when I would speak to large audiences is that I'd stop right in the middle of a speech and apropos of nothing, I would say, is everyone comfortable? And they'd be like, yeah. I say, no, seriously, are you really comfortable? Are you, is there anything we can do to make you more comfortable? And they'd be like, we're completely comfortable, go on. And then I would say, so how many of you, if you were home alone right now, would be sitting in exactly the position you're in at this moment? And no one would raise a hand because they're sitting like in these straight chairs. And, and then I'd say, why? Why would you not be in this position? And they'd have to think. These are like very intelligent people. And after like a minute, someone would finally go, oh, I'm not really that comfortable. And nobody was comfortable. They were comfortable enough. It wasn't a tragedy. The problem is that they really believed they were comfortable when they knew stone cold knew they weren't comfortable. So they were lying to my face and thinking they were telling the truth. And it's that split that takes us out of integrity. So when somebody is being complacent, here's the thing, they will begin to suffer. They will begin to feel bad moods, then they'll get bad health, then their relationships will suffer, then their career will suffer, then they might even get an addiction or an obsession of some kind to medicate the pain. And all of those are the signs that somebody is out of integrity in the, for the best of all possible reasons and needs to, could really use an integrity cleanse, I used to call them. <laughs> yes. We have a time for, I think, probably two more questions. There's one from Sohad who says, and I know you can answer this because you've lived it. How does one live in harmony when your spiritual or religious beliefs may not match or agree with some of your loved ones, i.e. family, friends, or significant other? Yeah. That's a hard one. And in most cases, you just gently drift in your own direction and everybody sort of, maybe you have a few arguments, but everybody's fine. If you belong to an, uh, like Mormonism as a life world religion, um, that means that it fills every aspect of the day and community. And in those cases, often um, I quit the Mormon church, but if I hadn't, I would have been excommunicated for sure. And that means excommunicated. No one communicates with you, right? And it's the worst loss a person can suffer. But if you're in a community that is toxic to your truth, it's also what needs to go. And you will find, and Jesus says it's in, this in the Bible. He says, whoever leaves father and mother to follow me will get a hundred fathers and a hundred mothers. And that's what I found to be true, that people who were, who felt more like kin came flooding into my life when I started living in a way that spiritually felt true to me. It was horrible and hard and wonderful and great. Thank you. I think this will be our, our last audience question. Um, this one's from Amy, who says, in April, I bought your book and started my integrity cleanse. No Woo. lies. I've reached a state of peace and have moments of bliss. Did you still want more after all good stuff emerged in your life? How can we encourage others to reach this state of peace and bliss? Thank you, Martha, for the gift of you. There's so much liberation through your teachings. Oh, gives me the chills. That's so wonderful. And I have to tell you, I've never seen an outside limit on how good things can get. Just when I think literally I could not be more blessed, it, it, something comes and just blows the roof off again. So I think that the reason consciousness is manifesting itself in physical form or apparently physical form right now in us for human things having a spiritual experience is to see how much joy and how much delight we can feel in this form. Uh, Emerson said beauty is its own excuse for being and when I was a suicidal teenager I read that and I thought joy is its own excuse for being. It's the feeling, it's beauty felt and I thought, if I can find joy, it will be worth living. 
and it has been, and I have, it just keeps increasing. And I don't think I'm even anywhere near the place where, you know, the, the enlightened folks that I know, I mean, what they describe, I think I've tasted a tiny bit, but there's a long way to go and things just get better and better and better. And that goes on even through the losses and injuries and aging and damage that are involved in a human life. There is no limit to the joy, to the absolute pure ecstasy of living um, once you get to the, to the place of full integrity. I'm just so glad you're there and you, by living that, will bring other people into it. Just live it. Thank you, Martha. I want to just give you one, one lovely comment from Denise, who says, I don't have a question, but rather a comment. I find you absolutely delightful, Martha. <laughs> I agree, Denise. Over the years, your writing has served as a guiding light in my life. I very much look forward to reading your new book with a heart. Oh, Denise, we are not separate. That's one thing you realize. That's one thing Dante realizes in when he gets to paradise. He's, he kind of lays out quantum mechanics, actually. And he sees reality differently. And he sees that no two people are separate, that nothing is separate, that we are all made of one huge light. And that there is nothing greater than the joy of reuniting after separation. And the moment we come into truth, we start to reconnect with ourselves and millions of other people. I'm just happy we are doing that, Denise and everybody. And thank you, Ross. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Martha, for joining us today. It's really been awesome to have you here. And I really hope that everybody goes out and gets this book. You can get it from our website, banyan.com, The Way of Integrity finding the path to your true self, really fantastic, um, elevating book. And um, just a big thank you to everybody who joins us from the Banyan community, such a wonderful supportive community that we have around the world. And uh, to everybody that works in the store at Banyan, to, our, to the owner of Banyan, Colin Limworth, and uh, to our, our producer, Jacob Steele, who's responsible for making all these amazing free events happen. Thank you. And Martha, again, thank you so much for being here thanks to everyone i just i've had a lovely time and you're wonderful thank you ross <laughs>